we do some advisory and transactional stuff here and there uh, just because we litigate so much that clients then come to us and say, hey, okay, that was nice, but let's make sure that this doesn't happen again, right? Yeah. So, well. Sure, it's, mm -hmm. it's quite different being mm -hmm. on both sides. Yeah, right? it is, but it brings so much perspective, right? And sometimes it's nice to have that perspective and just be kind of the, the voice of reason in the room. What I don't think a lot of people know about is something that goes left. There's mm -hmm. specific steps that you have to exactly. take, right? Exactly. And you can totally throw the whole thing under the water if you take the wrong steps. Exactly. So when you're looking for lawyers um, for a construction case, it sounds redundant, but the first thing you should do is make sure they're a construction <laughs> lawyer. Yeah. You're like, oh, you're a lawyer? And I, what kind of law do you practice? Construction law. And they're like, what is that? Right? Like everybody's like, that's not, that's not sexy. Is yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> like, what is that? Is a handshake agreement? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Which is never good. You know, it's. I think I don't know if it's like a Texas thing or maybe it's just like a thing in the South, but people pride themselves on not needing contracts. Oh, I've never had to deal with this and that. You know, we just shake hands and that's always been good enough. And I'm like, all right. You it's know. always good enough until it's not. Exactly. Right. <laughs>
when things happen, you know, our firm is set up as a, as a litigation boutique. We do some advisory and transactional stuff here and there uh, just because we litigate so much that clients then come to us and say, hey, okay, that was nice, but let's make sure that this doesn't happen again, right? Yeah. But for the most part, people come to us, when, they, when, I, when I get a call or an email, that means a project has already gone bad or they see it's going bad. And the easiest situation is when they see it's going bad because they call us in, in advance mm -hmm. and we're able to do different things uh, to set the case up for success or try to put it in the best position uh, for success. And so early on, don't just wing it. I tell people like, don't just, you know, you start getting letters and, you know, some people are just firing off emails or mm -hmm. jumping on phones. It's very dangerous. You know, when you feel a dispute brewing and most of the time, you know, you know, you could tell, you feel the dispute happening. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, let me start getting somebody involved that can correctly uh, help me navigate this situation. So. Yeah. So we're going to make this a series with Kenneth and talk mm -hmm. about all things because there's definitely lots of subjects we can discuss and taking deep dives into the um, construction law. Yeah, definitely. And so today I just want to kind of give people a little bit of information about red flags that they may want to look for when hiring a GC and then we can give somebody maybe a little bit of information on kind of the steps that they need mm -hmm. to take when looking for a construction lawyer mm -hmm. um, and what is going to be beneficial for them if something mm -hmm. goes wrong. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So um, when you're looking to hire a GC, you know, some, some red flags that may jump out at you. First, just like anything else, you want to look at their experience mm -hmm. doing the type of project that you're going to have them doing, right? If it's a residential job, you want to see how many residential projects they've run. And I think a common misconception um, on the residential side in particular is that if there's a GC that does really, really big commercial jobs, that they're super sophisticated, mm. and so they're probably going to be able to handle my small residential project. But that doesn't necessarily wind up being the case. And the reason for that is primarily that um, GCs have relationships with subtrades, right? Mm -hmm. And so the subcontractors that are doing the work um, are just as important as the GC and that relationship between the two is very important. If a general contractor's relationship is mostly with those that do commercial work, uh, then they're going to struggle managing subcontractors on residential projects because they're night and day, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's different if the GC has a tendency to do both or plays in both arenas, but I'm talking about somebody that normally does just commercial work. Residential is a different ball game. The margins are different. Uh, the, the subcontractors are different. You know, it's just a different way of doing construction. And so uh, that's one thing you want to look at. You want to say, okay, if this person only does commercial and I've got a residential project, that's a red flag. This person only does residential and you got a commercial project, that's a red flag. Another thing to look at, I think, is the individual that is that is running the company. Uh, you know, you can look them up the same way you would an employee. You try to do, you know, a background check. How are they, have they been in any trouble? Have they been sued? Mm -hmm. Any fraud out there? Any financial issues out there? Those are some, some different things that should raise the alarm because you're getting ready to entrust this person with a considerable amount of money, mm -hmm. considerable amount of responsibility. And so uh, that's something that you should definitely look at. Another thing is um, how often has the company been sued, right? And so if you look up a company and you know there's 10, 15 different lawsuits out there, especially if they're recent, mm. that, may, that may raise a red flag, right? And, and maybe not as much if it's a GC and it's one project, because some project, we all have that, We've all been involved in that project from hell where just, you know, for a GC, it goes south uh, for one reason or another, and then 10, 15 different subs wind up suing them. Mm -hmm. You want to avoid it. It's never ideal, but that's mm -hmm. one project. Mm -hmm. When you start looking at multiple projects over and over and over, um, and there's litigation, that, you know, may cause some concern because you should look at that and say, well, we probably are going to end up in litigation, right? Yeah, so maybe look in more into detail mm -hmm. as far as what's happening there uh, because it does, it would scare people even mm -hmm. if they see one lawsuit. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. They should really take a more of a deep dive into what happened there. Most definitely. Uh, instead of just immediately eliminating the person. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely because you don't know the circumstances surrounding it, right? I mean, I, I represent a lot of GCs and I've just been involved in a lot of those projects where you know, for one reason or another, there's a disagreement up the chain. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's uh, between the bank and the owner. 
maybe it's between the owner and the contractor, and then money stops flowing. And once the money stops flowing to the GC, unless the GC is liquid enough to just finance it, or wants it, and sometimes it isn't even an issue of liquidity as mm -hmm. much as it is, you know, that's a lot of risk on a, on a contractor yeah. to bankroll paying for something when they haven't been paid. Because they don't know if they're gonna get back charged or whatever. And so when that happens, you know, a lot of the sub trades, they go and get lawyers, they file liens, they file lawsuits. And so you'll see on one project, there'll be, the bigger the project especially, yeah. be multiple lawsuits. So I wouldn't say, you know, the lawsuit in and of itself is a is something you should eliminate someone for but i do think that you know it, it warrants a deeper dive mm -hmm. it warrants a you know a pretty pretty good look into the company for sure yeah, um, yeah for sure mm -hmm. that's a good that's a good information for people mm -hmm. and then as far as if the unfortunate circumstances happens and somebody needs your services as mm -hmm. a construction lawyer what are the steps that they should take mm -hmm. to find one um, what do they do? Should they immediately fire um, their, their GC? Yeah. I think there's a lot of confusion mm -hmm. on that topic to make sure that things go the right direction. No, so what, definitely. what would be your advice there? Uh, so if you feel a dispute brewing, uh, you shouldn't just fire the contractor. Like that's a, a common mistake. Mm -hmm. It's huge, especially when you know, most contracts have provisions in them that are termination provisions. There's termination procedures and things of that nature. Um, there's circumstances by which the, the uh, contractor can be terminated, and there's different types of terminations. There's terminations for cause, terminations for convenience, and your exposure uh, increases or decreases based on what you do. And so if you need, if you feel that coming, the first thing you should do is look at counsel. Start, mm -hmm. to, start to seek counsel. Okay, and so when you're looking for lawyers um, for a construction case, it sounds redundant, but the first thing you should do is make sure they're a construction lawyer, <laughs> yeah. right? And, and specifically that they have uh, experience with the type of issues that you're having because construction is a very, very broad space, mm -hmm. right? And so a lot of times people just think a construction lawyer is just a construction lawyer is a construction lawyer. And that's not necessarily the case. Yes, a lot of us handle multiple areas of construction law, but there are some of us that are very specific. There's lawyers that you know make all of their money uh, representing insurance companies in coverage disputes uh, regarding whether or not something is defective and should be covered by insurance. That's not a lawyer that you would want to use in a payment dispute, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so lawyers, I mean, you go and look at lawyers and law firms, all of the profiles are online. You can get online, you can look, see what kind of work they've done, uh, representative experience. You can go in the counties where they practice and see the type of cases and stuff that they filed. Um, and so you should do that. Uh, another thing that you most definitely should do is set up a meeting, you know, talk to them about your issue, uh, have a consultation. Even if they're charging you for the consultation, it's money well spent, mm, right? Yeah. Because it's helping you to do the investigation, but it's also uh, giving you, a good consultation should give you some insight as to what you should be doing uh, moving forward, right? And so I think that's very important to do. Go, go to the lawyer's office, right? Take the time to go there because that matters. I mean, if you go there and it's, you know, something that looks like chaos, then maybe your situation will be handled chaotically, yeah. <laughs> right? Which in construction, it's already chaotic. <laughs> exactly, so many documents, yeah. so many yeah. different things. Um, and then I think another thing is, depending on the size of your matter, um, that should also dictate the size of the, the firm or the, or the uh, practice group that you're going with, right? I mean, if you have a $100,000 dispute, you don't need, you know, a 5,000 lawyer law firm, mm -hmm. you know, you'll wind up paying a lot more money nine times out of 10. Um, and, and really under most circumstances, I mean, even if the firm is super huge, only maybe four or five lawyers are gonna be working on your case at the most, even if it is a bigger case, right? I mean, unless we're talking hundreds of millions mm -hmm. uh, in dispute. And so you wanna try to line those things up, keep that in mind. Uh, you know, when you're looking. So go online, look at the firm, look at how many lawyers actually practice in that area that there's adequate support uh, at the firm for your, for your matter. 
And um, yeah, just do that kind of research and investigation because all of that stuff matters when you're hiring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned earlier when you got into this that mm -hmm. there wasn't that many lawyers that did this type of work mm -hmm. and that's really surprising to yeah. me because you would think with construction, how much construction goes on mm -hmm. out there on a daily basis and the unfortunateness of it is a lot of the times it goes wrong. Mm -hmm. You would think more and more people or more lawyers would, would get into this, uh, this yeah. field. You know, I think more lawyers are starting to recognize that there's a lot of opportunity in construction law. But I think that for a lot of lawyers coming out of law school, we just didn't know it was its own thing. Mm. I mean, you go to law school and you're taught, you know, these your first year is like these basic courses that are all like archaic theory, right? You're like, I mean, it's, it's old property laws and all that different stuff and contract laws. It's just these basic courses. Mm -hmm. Then you start getting into some, you know, uh, things that are practice specific, but construction law, at least at my law school, wasn't a thing. And in many of the law schools that I, you know, hear about, they're starting to add it or they've added it in the last, you know, five or 10 years. But originally, you know, you have those kind of core courses. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, construction law is grouped in under contracts or property law or uh, commercial litigation, but people fail to realize until after you get out of law school that it is very much its own specific area. It's its its, it's, its own body of law because of the overlap of all these different bodies of law that it touches. And so, yeah, I think that it's just one of those things where it, it will continue to have more and more people join the practice area mm -hmm. just because I mean, it's very litigious. Um, it's very easy to wind up in a dispute and it's very complex. So it's a space where you do need a lot of lawyers, uh, but we just, I think a lot of us didn't know, at least speaking for myself and a lot of the people that I talk to mm -hmm. every day. I mean, I can go to a networking event and um, they're like, oh, you're a lawyer? And I, what kind of law do you practice? Construction law. And they're like, what is that? Right? <laughs> like everybody's like, that's not, that's not sexy. It's, yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> like, what is that? It's like, well, I handle contract disputes between contractors and, you know, and it's a snore fest for them. <laughs> so they don't, they don't understand it. No, so. there's definitely a lot into it though. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's amazing mm -hmm. that, um, that there's so much involved with it. Yeah. So, it's yeah. just so many different layers of contracts. I think when I, whenever we hire a new associate at the firm, you know, I start by just like outlining the different players and then it starts to click for them, like why there's so much. Uh, litigation and so many disputes because you got so many different parties on the chain and there's so many different contractual relationships mm -hmm. that are impacted by one another and so if one thing goes wrong in one place there's just this ripple effect and so that's why you know it's just so layered and convoluted so and you yeah. you've done uh, obviously you mentioned you represent a lot of gcs but mm -hmm. you've also worked with large companies mm -hmm. too mm -hmm. yeah i so we do a lot of owner work um, really large, you know, Fortune 100 companies. We've had the good fortune and been blessed to represent some of the largest companies in the country, uh, if not the world, um, public entities. So, mm -hmm. you know, governments, counties, um, you know, states and cities, uh, we do, do work for them. And when they're having construction disputes, we'll you know, be dealing with contractors or dealing with bonding companies, sureties, which is always fun to do with <laughs> surety. Um, and so just, Pretty much every everybody on the chain we've done some work for. We don't do as much subtrade work anymore, mm -hmm. um, just because you know you start having a potential to run into a lot of conflicts if you you know represent a lot of GCs, but then you start representing subs, you could run into a lot of conflicts. And so we have a tendency to uh, separate them. Like on the public side, we generally represent owners mm -hmm. of governments and stuff like that because we don't want to be suing you know a bunch of gcs and vice versa if we're on that public side and then on the private side it's mostly gcs uh large contractors but we do have some uh private companies as I'm well sure it's, mm -hmm. it's quite different being mm -hmm. on both sides yeah right? it is <laughs> but it brings so much perspective right and sometimes it's nice to have that perspective and just be kind of the the voice of reason in mm -hmm. the room because mm -hmm. i mean think about it if you represent you know, some large energy company and, you know, they, there's a contractor on the other side and they're late and they're delayed and there's all these different things happening and, you know, the, your clients live it. 
if you've been on that other side, you can offer that insight as to what's going on and say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. They're not trying to screw you. They're not, you know, like everybody, let's just take a deep breath for a minute. Have we considered the prospect that this is what might be going on, right? Because I was involved in a case before where this is what happened. And then everybody starts kind of thinking about different perspectives. And it's the same thing on the other side as well. Mm -hmm. And so I think having that perspective is helpful. Mm -hmm. Now, I always like to ask my guests, and I'm sure you have plenty of these, mm -hmm. horror stories. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And I, know, I, I, always, yeah. I always ask this kind of on the fly because I yeah. like to have somebody just be like, you know what, yeah, this is what happened. And of course, I know as a lawyer, you can't go in too much detail about things mm -hmm. and names and all that stuff. But I'm just curious. Mm -hmm as to what may be interesting or a uh, horror story yeah. that you can share of interest to the people. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so I'm gonna do this. Let me see, I'm trying to think through how to do it without like divulging anything. Um, so I have a client, um, actually he's a really good friend of mine now. So that's mm -hmm. like, you know, um, I can talk about this. Okay. He's, he's, he's cool, really <laughs> good friend good. of mine. So, uh, I've been representing him for a, a while now. He has a contracting company um, out of Dallas and they do a lot of um, vertical construction, mm -hmm. hotels, commercial buildings, things of that nature. And so <laughs> I think this was like maybe a few years ago, maybe before the maybe before the pandemic, he gets sued in federal court by a subcontractor and he tells me, hey, I'm being sued by the sub. And I'm thinking it's no big deal. And then I get the, the complaint, the federal complaint, and he's being sued for racketeering under the RICO Act, right? <laughs> and the person's like trying to bring criminal charges and all this different stuff. And so I have the conversation with him and I'm like, no, nah, it's probably not that big of a deal. We'll get in here and we'll deal with it. Lo and behold, they do bring criminal charges and he's literally charged <laughs> and arrested. He calls me, he's like, hey man, you know, so we wind up having to get with criminal counsel and the whole nine. And it was a it was a very scary, you know, big mess. It was the first time I had been involved in anything where, you know, my client was actually looking at going to prison. Oh, wow. And um, I'm on the civil side. We had criminal counsel on the criminal side. And, you know, a lot of what I did was in was kind of predicated on also trying to make sure that you know, the criminal stuff goes well and the civil stuff was moving faster. And so I would work with criminal counsel on getting things done. Well, we wind up following what, what's called a 12B6 motion. We wind up being able to get the uh, civil stuff dismissed and the civil stuff was the basis for the criminal charge. And so once we got that dismissed, his criminal lawyer was able to go and, and get the cases against him dropped. But it was about a year and a half of not only being, you know, this person's lawyer, but when they say counselor, because, you know, they're going through it. There's anxiety. There's wow, all these different yeah. things. And he's calling. He's just like, man, I got to, you know, what's going on? I got to get this dealt with. So that case was a nightmare. It was a horror story. It's something that, you know, I'm, I'm glad to have experienced it because if it ever happens again, mm -hmm. I know how to navigate that. Right. But at the time, you know, most of the time I'm just fighting over money for people. Right. The right. Stakes are high, but they're not that high in that situation we were talking about somebody's li like life and family on the line. You yeah, know? there's and a was, huge difference it was, when it comes to <laughs> prison or just money exactly. disputes for sure. Exactly, and so that was, uh, that was interesting, it was scary, but you know, we got through it, so. Well, that's good. I'm glad <laughs> it came out in the best way for him yeah, because that is, that is, wow, that is scary. Yeah. Um, so this is, I mean, this is an interesting thing too, when speaking of, I'm going to touch on the contracts a mm -hmm. little bit. Mm -hmm. So I think in our next episode, we'll, we'll take more of a deep dive into mm -hmm. contracts. Um, but I think, I mean, I, as, as a GC, um, have seen other people's contracts that they have presented to me as far as clients, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Oh, this is what I was given by my old guy. And it's kind of mm -hmm. like, some of them are very questionable. Yeah, yeah. And there's so much that should be involved in a contract to mm -hmm. save both sides, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So in your opinion, I mean, what, what should a person look at when they're presented a contract mm -hmm. by a, a GC or, you know, whoever it may yeah. be to make sure that they're covered mm -hmm. properly? Yeah, so we're definitely going to have to do another episode because that, <laughs> sure. that is a huge question. <laughs> I think a lot of stuff is um, going to be situation specific, to be completely honest with you. I don't think that any two 
companies um, and any given project is going to have just a should have just a universal contract. Mm -hmm. I'm a big proponent of, you know, customizing agreements for certain projects uh, to take into a con take into account the risks that may be involved in that project that may not have been involved in the previous project mm -hmm. uh, or with the previous contractor or the previous owner. Right. And so um, we can we can definitely do a deep dive into that and, and talk about some examples. But I do think that there are some universal constants. And uh, one of those things that I'm a big proponent of um, is whatever you all decide uh, to how you're going to resolve your disputes. Let's let's get that in the contract. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times people are overlooking dispute resolution provisions in their agreement. It's just kind of like a boilerplate thing. Everybody's looking at time. Everybody's looking at payments, right? Everybody's mm -hmm. looking at termination. Uh, everybody's looking at scope. And those things are really important. But you know, these kind of well, what ifs, right? The what happens if we're in a dispute? What's the procedure? Are we gonna go to mediation first? Are we gonna go to arbitration? If we're going to arbitration, which arbitration group are we using? Are we using the uh, AAA, using JAMS? Are we just going to go to court? If we're going to go to court, where are we having the fight? Is it in the same county where the project is? Or is it, you know, in some other random location? Which laws are going to govern? You have companies from two different places sometimes. The out-of-state company wants to use Nevada law, right? It's mm -hmm. like, why, why would you do that, right? And, yeah. so, <laughs> and so you all of these different things, I think, I, th I don't think they're considered when people are uh, drafting these contracts, particularly sometimes contractors just want the work, right? They just want the job. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they get the contract and these things, if they get what they want on scope, they get what they want on this, they check the box and call it a day. But a nightmare for me as your counsel is when we're fighting over where we're going to have the fight mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you're throwing a bunch of money at a dispute and we haven't even gotten to the issue of the dispute. We're just trying to fight over where we're going to have the fight and what type of fight we're going to have. And that is maddening. So those are some things, you know, that are like universal, like universal constants, I think. It's just you want to figure out what that, what that procedure looks like, where you're having the fight, what laws govern. Um, oh, and another one is modifications and change orders. Mm -hmm. I think you have to universally have a system that if you're on the contractor side, your team understands this is how we are handling changes and modifications. If not, it gets confusing and things go left. So Because that there's always changes exactly. and modifications. Exactly, right? When it comes to construction, like 100%. every single project, there's something. It never just is exactly the way that you think, whether it's more time, mm -hmm. whether it's more money, scope changes, mm -hmm. something unknown or unforeseen. And so you got to have a process where everybody's on the same page that, hey, you're not just going to go and talk to somebody in the field and get a change order signed, right? Yeah. It's like you have to have that understood. So those are some universal things I think that, you know, you kind of want to drill down. So, I mean, I, so from what I gather on that note, it's very important for people, say, as homeowners that are mm -hmm. going to have somebody come in and do a, you know, renovation in their home that they have a contract that's prepared by an attorney. Yes. Because I have seen a lot of those where it's just like, seems like their GC just kind of typed up something mm -hmm. and there's nothing really legal exactly. to it. Yeah. And I think that gets people in a real pinch. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times folks just pull something from off the internet, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, I see it because when I look at the agreement, it has a bunch of stuff in there that's not applicable to the homeowner's situation. Um, or, you know, it might even still have some stuff in it from the previous <laughs> thing that it was online, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you, regardless of whether the GC preps it or whether it's a contract you're doing, get an attorney involved in mm -hmm. it so that you know, you know, what you're dealing with. Because um, if not, you're setting, you can be setting yourself up for failure, right? And specifically with residential, um, on the contractor side, if you're a contractor and you're doing residential work, you are in a very dangerous area because Texas protects homeowners. Mm -hmm. Texas does not play about homeowners. And so you want to make sure as the GC that your contract has all the language in it that it's supposed to have by law. There are certain clauses, certain things that have to be in there. There are certain ways that you have to um, get the contract executed in order to be able to have that contract be enforceable. Mm -hmm. So for example, if, if you're dealing with someone's homestead and they're married, 
in order for you to have certain rights under the law, you have to get the contract ex executed by both both homeowners, mm -hmm. husband and wife, or you know both owners of the home. So those are things that I think you, know, you, you definitely want to be cognizant of when you're doing this paperwork because a lot of times people aren't. Sometimes they don't even have contracts, which is terrifying. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's oof. That's not good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like I get calls and I'm like, was there some kind of agreement? And they're like, nope. And we're not talking about small sums of money. I mean, we're talking about, you know, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars with no agreement in place, which is crazy. The handshake agreement? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> which is never good. You know, it's, I think, I don't know if it's like a Texas thing or maybe it's just like a thing in the South, but people pride themselves on not needing contracts. Oh, I've never had to deal with this and that. You know, we just shake hands and that's always been good enough. And oh. I'm like, all right. You it's know. always good enough until it's not exactly right <laughs> until it goes bad and then you're wishing because now you're saying well you know we had this and we said that and you don't have anything to to document it and so you know there's nothing wrong with thinking about these things on the front end it's very important you know yeah. so wow well, stay tuned for the next episode when we get really deep into contracts. That's an, That to me is an exciting, um, I know, that doesn't seem like that's right. <laughs> I don't know if it is. I mean, I don't know. It's interesting yeah, to me. I hear you. I hear you. This stuff is something that obviously I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, I'm interested in, but to the everyday viewer, probably not. But if they're watching your show, I mean, they're probably excited as well. Maybe it, taking notes. Yeah, and that is the idea mm -hmm. behind this, is mm -hmm. to get information out there more mm -hmm even general information for people when mm -hmm. they are looking to get a project and make sure that they have themselves covered on all aspects, not just contracts, but just the whole scope in general. Yeah, so definitely. I appreciate you sitting with me today and giving the me. information. Yeah. And that's it for this episode. Stay tuned for the next one. Yeah. Bye.